I was sick. I was sick, but more than that, I was mad. Mad at the crooked police and mad at the crooked game of life. So I wrote to the chief of police at Peoria. I am here in my girlhood home in Spoon River, gradually wasting away, but come and take me. I killed the son of the merchant prince in Madame Luz. And the papers that said he killed himself in his bedroom while cleaning a hunting gun? Lied like the devil to hush up a scandal for the bribe of advertising. In my room, I shot him at Madame Luz because he knocked me down when I told him that in spite of all the money he had, I would see my lover that night. Searcy Foot. I wanted to go away to college, but rich Aunt Persis wouldn't help me. So I made gardens, and raked the leaves, and bought John Alden's books with my earnings, and toiled for the very means of life. I wanted to marry Delia Prickett, but how could I with what I earned? And there was Aunt Persis, more than seventy, her throat so paralyzed when she ate, the soup ran from her mouth like a duck. A gourmand yet? investing her income in mortgages, toiling away at her rents and papers and notes. That day, I was sawing wood for her and reading Pruden in between. I went in the house for a glass of water, and there she was, lying in her chair, and Pruden on the table, and a bottle of chloroform on the book she used sometimes for her aching tooth. I put the chloroform on a handkerchief and held it to her nose till she died. Oh, Delia, Delia, you and Pruden steadied my hand, and the coroner said she died of heart failure. I married Delia and got the money. A joke on you, Spoon River? At first, I suspected something. She acted so calm and absent minded. Then one day, I heard the back door shut as I entered in the front, and I saw him slink back of the smokehouse into the lot and run across the field. And I meant to kill him on sight, but that day, walking near Fourth Bridge without a stick or stone at hand, all of a sudden I saw him standing, scared to death, holding his rabbits. And all I could say was, don't, 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 as he aimed and fired at my heart. Silent before the jury, returning no word to the judge when he asked me if I ought to say against the sentence, only shaking my head. What could I say to people who thought that a woman of 35 was at fault when her lover of 19 killed her husband? Even though she said to him over and over, go away, Elmer, go far away. I have maddened your brain with the gift of my body. You will do some terrible thing. And just as I feared, he killed my husband, with which I had nothing to do before God silent for 30 years in prison, and the iron gates of Juliet swung as the gray and silent trustees carried me out in a coffin. What but the love of God could have softened and made forgiving the people of Spoon River toward me, who wronged the bed of Thomas Merritt and murdered him beside? O oh, loving hearts that took me in again when I returned from 14 years in prison. O oh, helping hands that in the church received me and heard with tears my penitent confession, who took the sacrament of bread and wine. Repent, ye living ones, and rest with Jesus.
village poetess, hooted at, jeered at by the yasus of the street, for my heavy body, cockeye, rolling walk. And all the more when Butch Weldy captured me after a brutal hunt, he left me to my fate with Dr. Myers. And I sank unto death, growing numb from the feet up, like one stepping deeper and deeper into a stream of ice. Would someone go to the village newspaper and gather into a book the verses I wrote? I hungered so for love. I thirsted so for life. You would not believe, would you, that I came from good Welsh stock? That I was purer blooded than the white trash here? That I was of more direct lineage than the New Englanders and Virginians of Spoon River, that I had been to school and read some books. No, you saw me only as a run-down man with matted hair and ragged clothes. Sometimes a man's life turns into a cancer from being bruised and continually bruised until it swells into a purplish mass. Like stalks on growths of corn, he was I, a carpenter, mired in a bug of life into which I walked, thinking it was a meadow. With a slattern for a wife and poor, poor Minerva, my daughter, who you tormented and drove to death. So I crept, crept like a snail through the days of my life. No other man, unless it was Doc Hill, did more for the people in this town than I. All the weak, the halt, the impoverished, and those who could not pay flocked to me. I was good-hearted, easy Dr. Myers. I was healthy, happy, and comfortable fortune, blessed with a congenial mate. My children raised, all wedded, and doing well in the world. And then one night, Minerva, the poetess, came to me in her trouble, crying. I tried to help her out. She died. They indicted me. The newspapers disgraced me. My wife perished of a broken heart and pneumonia finished me. He protested all his life long. The newspapers lied about him villainously, for he was not at fault from a nervous fall, but only tried to help her. Poor soul, so sunk in sin he could not see that even trying to help her, as he called it, he had broken the law, human and divine. Passers-by an ancient admonition to you if all of your ways would be ways of pleasantness and all of your pathways peace, love God and keep his commandments. After I got religion studied down, they gave me a job in the canning works. And every morning I had to fill the tank in the yard with gasoline that fed the blow fires in the shed to heat the soldering irons. And I mounted a rickety ladder to do it, carrying buckets full of the stuff. One morning, as I stood there pouring, the air grew still and seemed to heave. And I shot up as the tank exploded and down I came, both legs broken and my eyes burned crisp as an egg. For someone left a blow fire going and something sucked the flame in the tank. The circuit judge said whoever did it was a fellow servant of mine. And so the old road son didn't have to pay me. And I sat on the witness stand as blind as lack the filler, saying over and over. I didn't know him at all. Together in this grave lie Benjamin Pantier, attorney at law and gin, his dog, constant companion, solace, and friend. Down the gray road, friends, children, men and women, passing one by one out of life, left me till I was alone with gin for partner, bedfellow, comrade and drink. In the morning of life, I knew aspiration and saw glory. The she who survived me snared my soul with a snare which bled me to death, till I, one strong of will, lay broken, indifferent, living with gin in a room back of a dingy office, under my jawbone is snuggled the bony nose of gin, 
Our story is lost in silence. Go by, mad world. I know he said I stared his soul, which bled him to death. And all the men loved him, and most of the women pitied him. But perhaps you were a real lady with delicate taste, and loathed the smell of whiskey and onions, and the rhythm of Woodward's ode runs in your ears. Well, he goes about morning till night repeating bits of that common thing. Oh, why should the spirit of the mortal be proud? And then suppose you are a woman well endowed, and the only man with whom the law and morality permit you, permit you to have a marital relation is the very man that fills you with disgust. Every time you think of it while you think of it, every time you see him, that's why I drove him away from home to live with his dog in a dingy room back of his office. Well, Emily Sparks, your prayers were not wasted. Your love was not all in vain. I owe whatever I was in life to your hope that would not give me up and to your love that saw me still as good. Dear Emily Sparks, let me tell you the story. I passed the effect of my father and mother. The milliner's daughter made me trouble, and I went out into the world. I passed through every peril known of wine and women, and joy of life. And one night in a room in the Rue de Rivoli, I was drinking wine with a black-eyed madam. The tears swam into my eyes. She thought they were amorous tears and smiled for thought of her conquest over me. But yet my soul was 3,000 miles away in the days where you taught me in Spoon River. Just because no more you could love me or pray for me, nor write me letters. The eternal silence of you spoke instead. The black-eyed madam took the tears for hers as well as the deceiving kisses I gave her. Somehow from that hour I had a new vision. Dear Emily Sparks. my boy my boy in what far part of the world the boy I loved best in all the school I the teacher the old maid the virgin heart who made them all my children did I know my boy aright thinking of him as a spirit of flame active ever aspiring oh boy boy for whom I prayed and prayed in many a watchful hour at night do you remember the letter I wrote you of the beautiful love of Christ? And whether you ever took it or not, my boy, wherever you are, work for your soul's sake, that all the clay of you, all of the dross of you, may yield to the fire of you, till the fire is nothing but light. Nothing but light. Only the chemist can tell, and not always the chemist, what will result from compounding fluids or solids. And who can tell how men and women will interact with or on each other and what children will result? There are Benjamin Pantier and his wife, good in themselves, but evil towards each other. He oxygen, see hydrogen, their son a devastating fire. I, trainer, the druggist, killed while making an experiment, lived unwedded. If you, in the village, think that my life was a good one, who closed all the saloons and stopped all playing at cards? Who dragged Daisy Fraser in front of Judge Arnett in many a crusade to rid the people of sin? Why do you let the milliner's daughter Dora and the worthless son of Benjamin Pantier nightly Make my bed their unholy pillow. When Reuben Pantier ran away and threw me, I went to Springfield. There, I met a lush whose father, just deceased, left him a fortune. He married me when drunk. My life was wretched. 
A year passed and one day they found him dead. That made me rich. I moved on to Chicago. After time met Tyler Roundtree, villain. I moved on to New York. A gray haired magnate went mad about me. Another fortune. One night he died right in my arms, you know. I saw his purple face for years thereafter. Then I moved on to Paris. I was now a woman, insidious, subtle, versed in the world, and rich. My sweet apartment near the Champs Elysees became a center for all sorts of people. Musicians, poets, dandies, artists, nobles, where we spoke French and German, Italian, English. I wed Count Navigato, native of Genoa. We went to Rome. He poisoned me, I think. Now in the Campo Santo, overlooking the sea where young Columbus dreamed new worlds, see what they chiseled. Contessa Navigato Implora Eterna Quiete. I was the milliner, talked about, lied about, mother of Dora, whose strange disappearance was charged to her rearing. My eye, quick to beauty, saw much more than ribbons and buckles and feathers and leghorns and felts to set off sweet faces and dark hair and gold. One thing I will tell you and one I will ask. The stealers of husbands wear powder and trinkets and fabulous hats. Wives, wear them yourselves. Hats may cause divorce, but they also prevent them. Well, now, let me ask you, if all the children born here in Spoon River had been reared by the county somewhere on a farm and the fathers and mothers let live and enjoy, change mates if they wished, could Spoon River have been any the worse? It was just like everything else in life. Something outside of myself drew me down. My own strength never failed me. Why, there was a time I earned the money with which to go away to school and my father suddenly needed help and I had to give him all of it. Just so it went until I became a man of, well, I'll work in Spoon River. Thus, when I got the water tower cleaned, they hauled me up 70 feet. I unhooked the rope from my waist and laughingly flung my giant arms over the smooth steel lips of the top of the tower but they slipped from the treacherous slime and down, down, down I fell through the bellowing darkness. You know, horses and men are just alike. There was my stallion, Billy Lee, black as a cat and trim as a deer with an eye of fire keen to start and he could hit the fastest speed of any racer in Spoon River. But just as you'd think he couldn't lose with his lead of 50 yards or so, he'd rear himself and throw the rider, tangled up, completely gone to pieces. You see, he was the perfect fraud. He couldn't win, he couldn't work, he was too weak to haul or plow with, and no one wanted colts from him. And when, I, and when I tried to drive him well, he ran away and killed me. My name used to be in the papers daily, as having dined somewhere, or traveled somewhere, or rented a house in Paris where I entertained the nobility. I was forever eating, or traveling, or taking cure at Baden Baden. Now, I am here to do honor to Spoon River, here beside the family whence I sprang. No one cares now where I dined, or traveled, or how often I took cure at Baden Baden. Oh, you young radicals and dreamers, you dauntless fledglings who passed by my head stuff. Not, not the record of the captaincy in the army and the faith of God. They're not, they're not in denial of each other. Go by the reverency and read of sober care. How have great people riding in definite shouts, the centaur of the revolution, spurred and whipped to frenzy, shook with terror, seeing the mist of the sea over the pre precipice that they were nearing, and fell back in precipitate awe to celebrate the feast of the supreme being, moved from the same sense of the vast reality of both life and death, and the burden as they were with the fate of a race. How I, a little blasphemer, was caught in the drift of a nation's unloosened flood to remain a blasphemer.
and a captain in the army. I was the first fruit at the Battle of Missionary Ridge. When I felt the bullet enter my heart, I knew I should have stayed home and gone to jail for stealing the hogs of Curl Trenere. Rather a thousand times that counted jail than to lie here on this marble figure with wings and this granite pedestal bearing the world's pro-patria. What do they mean anyway? Nold Holheimer ran away to the war the day before Curl Trenary, swore out a warrant through Justa Arnett for stealing hogs. But that's not the only reason he turned to a soldier. He caught me running with Lucius Atherton. We crawled and I told him never again to cross my path. He stole then he stole the hogs and went off for the war. The back of every soldier is a woman. You never marveled, dullards of Spoon River, when Chase Henry voted against the saloons to revenge himself for being shut off. But none of you was keen enough to follow my steps or trace me home as Chase's spiritual brother. Do you remember when I fought the bank in the courthouse ring for pocketing the interest on public funds? And when, and when I fought our leading citizens for making the poor the pack horses of the taxes? And when I fought the waterworks for stealing streets and raising rates? And when I fought the businessmen who fought me in these fights? Then do you remember that staggering up from the wreck of defeat? and the wreck of a ruined career. I slipped from my cloak, my last ideal, hidden from all eyes until then, like the cherished jawbone of an ass, and smote the bank and the waterworks and the businessmen with prohibition, and made Spoon River pay the cost of the fights that I had lost. How does it happen? Tell me. That I, who was the most erudite of lawyers, who knew Blackstone and Coke almost by heart, who made the greatest speech the courthouse ever heard and wrote a brief that won the praise of Justice Breeze. How does it happen? Tell me that I lie here unmarked, forgotten. Will Chase Henry, the town drunkard, has a marble block taught by Nern? Where in nature and a mood ironical has sown a flowering weed. To this generation, I would say, memorize some bit of verse of truth or beauty. It may serve a turn in your life. My husband had nothing to do with the fall of the bank. He was only the cashier. The wreck was due to President Thomas Rhodes and his vain, unscrupulous son. Yet my husband was sent to prison and I was left with the children to feed and clothe and school them. And I did it. I set them forth into the world all clean and strong. And all through the wisdom of Pope the poet. Act well your part, there all the honors lie. Suppose you stood just five feet two and had worked your way as a grocery clerk, starting by candlelight until you became an attorney at law. And then suppose through your diligence and regular church attendance, you became attorney for Thomas Rhodes collecting notes and mortgages and representing all the widows in the probate court. And, and through it all, they jeered at your size and laughed at your clothes and your polished boots. And then suppose you became the county judge and Jefferson Howard and Kinsey Keene and Harmon Whitney and all the giants who had sneered at you were forced to stand before the bar and say, Your Honor, well, don't you think it was natural that I made it hard for them? How do you feel, you libertarians? who spent your talents rounding noble reasons around the saloon, as if liberty was not to be found anywhere except at the bar or at a table guzzling. How, do you How did you feel, Ben Pantier, and the rest of you who almost stoned me for a tyrant, garbed as a moralist and as a wry-faced aesthetic, frowning upon Yorkshire pudding, roast beef and ale, and goodwill and rosy cheer? Things you never saw in a grog shop in your life. How did you feel after I was dead and gone? And your goddess, Liberty, unmasked as a strumpet, selling out the streets of Spoon River to the insolent giants who manned the saloons from afar. Did it, did it occur to you that personal liberty is liberty of the mind rather than of the belly? Both for the country and for the man, and for a country as well as a man, 
Tis better to be feared than loved. And if this country would rather part with the friendship of every nation than surrender its wealth, I say of a man, tis worse to lose money than friends. And I, and I rend the curtain that hides the soul of an ancient aspiration. When the people clamor for freedom, they really seek for power over the strong. I, Anthony Finlay, rising to greatness from a humble water carrier, until I could say to thousands, come, and say to thousands, go. Affirm that a nation can never be good or achieve the good, where the strong and the wise have not the rod to use on the dull and weak. All they said was true. I wrecked my father's bank with my loans to dabble in wheat. But this was true. I was buying wheat for him as well, who couldn't margin a deal in his name because of his church relationship. And while George Reese was serving his term, I chased the will-o'-wisp of women in the mockery of wine in New York. It's deathly to sicken of wine and women when nothing else is left in life. But suppose your head is gray and bowed on a table covered with acrid stubs of cigarettes and empty glasses. And a knock is heard, and you know it's the knock. So long drowned out by popping corks and the peacock screams of demireps. And you look up and there's your theft. Who waited until your head was, was gray, gray and your heart skipped beats to say to you, the game is ended, I've called for you. Go out on Broadway and be run over. They'll ship you back to Spoon River. Have you seen, walking through the village, a man with downcast eyes and haggard face? That is my husband, who by secret cruelty, never to be told to me, robbed me of my youth and my beauty, till at last, wrinkled and with yellow teeth, and with broken pride and shameful humility, I sank into the grave. What think you gnaws at my husband's heart? The face of what I was, the face of what he made me. This is what's driving him to the place where I lie. In death, therefore I am avenged. She took my strength by minutes. She took my life by hours. She drained me in the fever mood that slaps in the springing world. The days went by like shadows. The minutes were wheeled like stars. She took the pity from my heart and made it into smiles. She was a hunk of sculptor's clay. My secret thoughts were her fingers. They flew behind her passive brow and lined deep with pain. They set the lips and sagged the cheeks and dropped the eyes with sorrow. My soul entered in the clay, fighting with seven devils. It was not mine, it was not hers. She held it, but its struggles molded a face that she hated and a face that I feared to see. I beat the window and shook the bolts. It hid me in the corner and then she died and haunted me. She haunted me for life. Henry got me with child, knowing that I could not bring forth life without losing my own. In my youth, therefore, I entered the portals of dust. Traveler, it is believed in the village where I live that Henry loved me with a husband's love, but I proclaim from the dust that he slew me to gratify his hatred. I was only eight years old, and before I grew up and knew what it meant, I had no words for it, except that I was frightened, and that I told my mother, and that my father got a pistol, and he would have killed Charlie, who was a big boy, 15 years old, except for his mother. Nevertheless, the story clung to me. The man that I married, a widower of 35, was a newcomer and hadn't heard it until two years after we were married. And then he considered himself cheated. Well, the village agreed that I was not really a virgin, and well, he left me, and I died the following winter. Maurice, weep not. I am not here under this pine tree. The balmy air of spring whispers through the sweet grass. The stars sparkle and the whippoorwill calls, but thou grievest while my soul lies rapturous in the blessed Naverna of eternal light. Go to the good heart that is my husband, who brews upon what he calls our guilty love. Tell him that my love for you, no less than my love for him, routes out our destiny. That through the flesh I have one spirit, and through spirit peace. There is no marriage in heaven, but there is love. Not character, not fortitude, not patience were mine, in which the village thought I had in bearing with my wife, while preaching on, doing the work God chose for me. I loathed her is a termagant, is a wanton. I knew of her adulteries, every one. But even so, if 
I divorce the woman, I must forsake the ministry. So lied I to myself. So lied I to Spoon River. So, yet I tried lecturing, ran for legislature, canvassed for books with just the thought in mind. If I make money thus, I will divorce her. With all your sorrow, Louise, and hatred of me, sprang from your delusion that it was wantonness of spirit and contempt of your soul's rights, which made me turn to Annabelle and forsake you. And you really grew to hate me for the love of me, because that was your soul's happiness, formed and tempered to solve your life for you and would not. But you were my misery. If you had been my happiness, would I not have clung to you? This is life's sorrow. That one can be happy only where two are. That our hearts are drawn to stars which want us not. My life's blossom might have all bloomed on all sides, save for a bitter wind which stunted my petals on the side of me which you in the village could see. From the dust I lift a voice of protest. My flowering side you never saw. Ye living ones, ye are fools indeed, who do not know the ways of the wind and the unseen forces that govern the processes of life. Your red blossoms amid green leaves are drooping, beautiful geranium. But you do not ask for water. You cannot speak. You do not need to speak. Everyone knows that you are dying of thirst. Yet they do not bring water. They pass on, saying, the geranium wants water. And I, who had happiness to share, and longed to share your happiness, I who loved you, Spoon River, and craved your love, withered before your eyes, Spoon River, thirsting, thirsting, voiceless from chasteness of soul to ask you for love, you who knew and saw me perish before you, like this geranium which someone has planted over me and left to die. Mr. Kessler, you know, was in the army, and he drew six dollars a month as a pension, and stood on the corner talking politics, or sat at home reading Grant's memoirs. And I supported the family by washing, learning the secrets of all the people by their curtains or counterpanes, skirts or shirts. For things that are new grow old, they're replaced with better or none at all. People are prospering or falling back and rents and patches widen with time. No needle or thread can pace decay. There are stains that baffle soap and there are colors that run in spite of you, blamed though you are for spoiling a dress. Handkerchiefs, napery have their secrets. The laundress life knows all about it. And I, who went to all the funerals held in Spoon River, can swear that I never saw a dead face without thinking it looked like something washed and iron. I winged my bird, though he flew toward the setting sun, but just as the shot rang out, he soared up and up through the splinters of golden light, till he turned right over, feathers ruffled, with some of the down on him floating near, and fell like a plummet into the grass. I tramped about, parting the tangles till I saw a splash of blood on a stump and the quail lying close to the rotten roots. I reached my hand but saw no briar, but something pricked and stung and numbed it. And then in a second I spied the rattler, the, sh the shutters wide in his yellow eyes, the head of him arched, sunk back into the rings of him, a circle of filth, the color of ashes, or oak leaves bleached under layers of leaves. I stood like a stone as he shrank and uncoiled and started to crawl beneath the stump when I fell limp in the grass. Almost the shell of a woman after the surgeon's knife and almost a year to creep back into strength till the dawn of our wedding decennial had me seeming myself again. We walked the forest together by a path of soundless moss and turf 
But I could not look into your eyes, and you could not look into my eyes. For such sorrow was ours, the beginning of grey in your hair, and I but a former shell of myself. And what, if, and what did we talk of? Sky and water, anything, almost, to hide our thoughts. And then your gift of wild roses, set on the table to grace our dinner. Poor heart, how bravely you struggled to imagine and live a remembered rapture. Then my spirit drooped as the night came on, and you left me alone in my room for a while, as you did when I was a bride. Poor heart. And I looked in the mirror, and something said, one should be all dead when one is half dead, nor ever mock life, nor ever, ever cheat love. And I did it, looking there in the mirror. Dear, have you ever understood? She loved me. Oh, how she loved me. I never had a chance to escape from the day she first saw me. But then after we were married, I thought she might prove her mortality and let me out, or she might divorce me. But, but few die, none resign. Then I ran away and was gone for a year on a lark, but she never complained. She said all would be well, that I would return. And I did return. I told her that while taking a row in a boat, I had been captured near Van Buren Street by pirates on Lake Michigan and kept in chains so I could not write her. She cried and kissed me and said it was cruel, outrageous, inhuman. I then concluded our marriage was a divine dispensation and could not be dissolved, except by death. I was right. He ran away and was gone for a year. When he came home, he told me silly stories of being kidnapped by pirates on Lake Michigan and kept in chains so he could not write me. I pretended to believe it, though I know very well what he was doing. Then he met the milliner, Miss Williams, now and then. And when she went to the city to buy her goods, as she said, but a promise is a promise, and marriage is marriage. And out of respect for my own character, I refuse to be drawn into a divorce by the scheme of my husband, who has merely grown tired of his own marital vow and duty. The secret of the stars, gravitation. The secret of the earth, layers of rock. The secret of the soil, to receive seed. The secret of the seed, the germ. The secret of man, the sower. The secret of woman, the soil. My secret, under a mound that you shall never find. Ye aspiring ones, listen to the story of the unknown who lies here with no stone to mark the place. As a girl, reckless and wanton, wandering in, with gun in hand through the forest near the mansion of Aaron Hatfield, I shot a hawk perched on top of a dead tree. He fell with a guttural cry at my feet, his wing broken. Then I put him in a cage where he lived many days calling angrily at me when I offered him food. Daily I searched the realms of Hades for the soul of the hawk, that I may offer him the friendship of one whom life wounded and caged. How many times during the 20 years I was your leader, friends of Spoon River, did you neglect the convention and caucus and leave the burden on my hands of guarding and saving the people's cause? Sometimes because you were ill or your grandmother was ill or you drank too much and fell asleep or else you said he is our leader. All will be well, he fights for us. We have nothing to do but follow. But oh, how you cursed me when I fell, and cursed me saying that I betrayed you in leaving the caucus room for a moment while the people's enemies there assembled, waited and watched for a chance to destroy the sacred rights of the people. You common rabble, I left the caucus to go to the urinal. I sat on the bank of Bob Bernadette and dropped crumbs in the water. 
just to see the minnows bump each other until the strongest got the prize. Or I went to my little pasture where the peaceful swan were asleep in the wallow or nosing each other lovingly and emptied a basket of yellow corn and watched them push and squeal and bite and trample each other to get the corn. And I saw how Christian Dahlman's farm of more than 3,000 acres swallowed the patch of Felix Schmidt as a bass will swallow a minnow. And I say, if there's anything in man, spirit or conscious or breath of God that makes him different from fishes or hogs, well, I'd like to see it work. My thanks, friends of the County Scientific Association for this modest boulder and this little tablet of bronze. Twice I tried to join your honored body and I was rejected. And when my little brochure on the intelligence of plants began to attract attention, you almost voted me in. After that, I grew beyond the need of you and your recognition. Yet, I do not reject your memorial stone, seeing that I should, in so doing, deprive you of honor to yourselves. They got me into the Sunday school at Spoon River and tried to get me to drop Confucius for Jesus. I could have been no worse off if I had tried to get them to drop Jesus for Confucius. For without any warning, as if it were a prank and sneaking up behind me, Harry Wiley, the minister's son, caved my ribs into my lungs with a blow of the fist. Now I shall never sleep with my ancestors in Peking, and no children shall worship at my grave. Ye young debaters over the doctrine, I who lie here was the village atheist, a talkative, contentious, versed in the arguments of the infidels. And through a long sickness, coughing myself to death, I read the Upanishads and the poetry of Jesus, and they lighted a torch of hope and intuition and desire which the shadow, leading me swiftly through the caverns of darkness, could not extinguish. But listen to me, ye who th live in the senses and think through the senses only. Immortality is not a gift. Immortality is an achievement, and those who strive mightily shall possess it. Back and forth, back and forth, to and from the church, with a Bible under my arm till I was gray and old, unwedded, alone in the world, finding brothers and sisters in the congregation and children in the church. I know they laughed and thought me queer. I knew of the eagle souls that flew high in the sunlight above the spire of the church, and they laughed at the church disdaining me, not seeing me. But if the high air was sweet to them, sweet was the church to me. It was the vision, vision, vision of the poets, democratized. I bought every kind of machine that's known. Grinders, shellers, planters, mowers, mills and rakes and plows and threshers. And all of them stood in the rain and sun, getting rusted, warped and battered for I had no sheds to store them in, and no use for most of them. And toward the last, when I thought it over, there by my window, growing clearer about myself as my pulse slowed down, I looked at one of my mills I bought, which I didn't have the slightest use of, as things turned out, and never used. A fine machine, once brightly varnished and eager to do its work, now with its paint washed off. I saw myself as a good machine that life had never used. There is something about death like love itself. If with someone with whom you have known passion and the glow of youthful love, you also, after years of life, together feel the sinking of the fire and thus fade away together, gradually, faintly, delicately, as it were in each other's arms, passing from the familiar room. That is the power of unison between souls, like, like love, love itself. itself. Dear Jane, dear winsome Jane, how you stole in the room where I lay so ill, in your nurse's cap and linen cuffs, and took my hand and said with a smile, you are not so ill, you'll soon be well. And how the liquid thought of your eyes sank in my eyes like dew that slips into the heart of a flower. Dear Jane, the whole McNeely fortune cannot have bought your care of me by day and night and night and day nor paid for your smile nor the warmth of your soul and your little hands lying on my brow <laughs> jane
chain. <laughs> the flame of life went out in the dark above the disk of sky. <laughs> I long, I long to be willing <laughs> to pillow my head on your little breast and hold you in a glass vest of love. <laughs> So please tell me, did my father provide for you when he died? J Jane? Dear Jane? With our hearts like drifting suns, had we but walked as often before, the April fields till starlight, silkened over with viewless gauze the darkness, under the cliff, our tricing place in the wood, where the brook turns. Had we but passed from wooing like notes of music that run together into winning in the inspired improvisation of love. But to put back of us as a canticle ended, okay, the rapt enchantment of the flesh in which our souls swooned down, down, where time was not, nor space, nor ourselves, annihilated in love. To leave these behind for a room with lamps and to stand with our secret mocking itself and hiding itself among flowers and mandolins, stared at by all between salad and coffee, and to see him tremble and feel myself prescient as one who signs a bond, not flaming with gifts and pledges heaped with rosy hands over his brow. And then, O oh night, deliberate, unlovely, with all of our wooing blotted out by the winning in a chosen room in an hour that was known to all, Next day he sat so listless, almost cold, so strangely changed, wondering why I wept. Till a kind of sick despair and voluptuous madness seized us to make the pact of death. A stalk of the earth sphere, frail as starlight, waiting to be drawn once again into creation streams. But next time to be given birth, gazed at by Raphael and St. Francis, sometimes as they pass. For I'm their little sister, to be known clearly face to face through a cycle of birth hereafter run. You may know the seed and the soil, you may feel the cold rain fall, but only the earth sphere, only heaven knows the secret of the seed and the nuptial chamber under the soil. Throw me into the stream again, give me another trial, save me Shelley. Spring and summer, fall and winter and spring after each other drifting past my window drifting and i lay so many years watching them drift and counting the years till a terror came in my heart at times with the feeling that i had become eternal at last my hundredth year was reached and still i lay hearing the tick of the clock and the low of the cattle and the scream of a jay flying through fallen leaves Day after day, alone in a room of the house of a daughter-in-law, stricken with age and gray, and by night, or looking out the window by day, my thought ran back. It seemed, through infinite time, to North Carolina and all my girlhood days. And John, my John, away to the war with the British, and all the children, the deaths, and all the sorrows. In that stretch of years, like a prairie in Illinois, through which great figures passed like hurrying horsemen. Washington, Jefferson, Jackson, Webster, Clay. Oh, beautiful young Republic, for whom my John and I gave all of our strength and love. And oh, my John, why, when I lay so helpless in bed for years, praying for you to come, was your coming delayed? Seeing that with a cry of rapture, like that I uttered when you found me in old Virginia after the war. I cried when I beheld you there by the bed, as the sun stood low in the west, growing smaller and fainter in the light of your face. There, at Geneva, where Mount Black floated above the wine-hued lake like a cloud, when a breeze was blown out of an empty sky of blue, and the roaring roan hurried under the bridge through the chasm of rock, and the music along the cafes was part of a splendor of dancing under the turret of light. And the pure part of the genius of Jean Rousset was the silent music of all we saw and heard. 
there at Geneva, I say it was a rapture list because I could not link myself with I or you. When 20 years before I wandered about Spoon River, no remember what I was, nor what I felt. We live in an hour free of all hours gone by. Therefore, O oh soul, if you lose yourself in death and wake up in some Geneva by Mount Blanc, what do you care if you not know yourself? As those who lived in a love in a little corner known as Spoon River, ages and ages vanished. Here lies the body of Lois Spears, born Lois Fluke, daughter of William Fluke, wife of Cyrus Spears, mother of Myrtle and Virgil Spears, children with clear eyes and sound limbs. I was born blind. I was the happiest of women, as wife, mother, and housekeeper, caring for my loved ones and making my home a place of order and bounteous hospitality. For I went about the rooms and about the garden with an instinct as sure as sight, as though there were eyes in my fingertips. Glory to God in the highest. Do the boys and girls still go to Seavers for cider after school in late September? Or gather hazelnuts among the thickets on Aaron Hatfield's farm where then the frost began? For many times with the laughing girls and boys played I along the road and over the hills when the sun was low and the air was cool, stopping to club the walnut tree standing leafless against a flaming west. Now, the smell of autumn smoke and the dropping of acorns and the echoes about the vales bring dreams of life. They hover over me. They question me. Where are those laughing comrades? How many were with me? How many in the old orchards along the way to Seavers and in the woods that overlook the quiet water? Not in that wasted garden where bodies are drawn into grass that feeds no flocks, and into evergreens that bear no fruit. That where along the shaded walks vain sighs are heard and vainer dreams are dreamed of close communion with the departed souls. But here, under the apple tree, I loved and watched and pruned with gnarled hands in the long, long years. Here, under the roots of this northern spy, to move in the chemic change in circles of life into the soil and into the flesh of the tree into the epitaphs of redder apples out of me unworthy and unknown the vibrations of deathless music with malice towards none and with charities towards all out of me the forgiveness of millions towards millions and the beneficent face of a nation shining with justice and truth. I am Anne Rutledge, who sleep beneath these weeds, beloved in life of Abraham Lincoln, wedded to him, not through union, but through separation. Oh, bloom forever, O Republic, from the dust of my bosom. I who kept the greenhouse, lover of trees and flowers, often light saw this umbrageous elm measuring its generous branches with my eye and listened to its rejoicing leaves lovingly patting each other with sweet aeolian whispers and while they might for the roots had grown so wide and deep that the soil of the hill could not withhold aught of its virtue enriched by the rain and warmed by the sun but yielded it all to the thrifty roots through which it was drawn and whirled to the trunk and hence to the branches and to the leaves wherefrom the breeze took life and sang. Now I, an under-tenant of the earth, can see that the branches of the tree spread no wider than its roots. And how shall the soul of a man be larger than the life he has lived? Samantha is forever talking of her own, but I did not need to die to learn about roots. I, who dug all the ditches about Spoot and River, look at my home! Sprung from a good a seed is hers, sown at the same time. It is dying at the top, not from lack of life, nor fungus, nor destroying insect, as the sexton thinks. Look, Samantha, where the roots have struck rock and can no further spread, all the while the top of the tree 
is tiring itself out, dying, trying to grow. Once in a while, a curious weed unknown to me, needing a name from my books. Once in a while, a letter from Yemen's. Out of the mussel shells gathered along the shore, sometimes a pearl with a glint like meadow rue. Then betimes a letter from Tyndall in England, stamped with the stamp of Spoon River. I, lover of nature, beloved for my love of her, held such converse afar with the great who knew her better than I. Oh, there is neither lesser nor greater, save as we make her greater and win from her keener delight. With the shells from the river, cover me, cover me. I lived in wonder, worshiping earth and heaven. I have passed on the march of eternal, of endless life. I would have thrust my hands of flesh into the disc, flowers be infested, into the mirror-like core of fire of the light of life, the sun of delight. For what are anthers worth, or petals, or halo rays? Mockery, shadows of the heart of the flower, the central flame. All is yours, young passerby. Enter the banquet room with the thought. Don't sidle in as if you were doubtful whether you're welcome. The feast is yours, nor take but a little, refusing with a bashful thank you. When you're hungry, is your soul alive? Then let it feed. Leave no balconies where you can climb, nor wilk white bosoms where you can rest, nor golden heads with pillows to share, nor wine cups while the wine is sweet, nor ecstasies of the body or soul. You will die, no doubt, but die while living, in the depths of azure, wrapped and mated, kissing the queen bee, life. Who carved this shattered harp on my stone? I died to you, no doubt, but how many harps and pianos wired I and tightened and disentangled for you, making them sweet again, with tuning fork or without? Oh well, a harp leaps out of the ear of a man, you say, but whence the ear that orders the length of the strings to a magic of numbers flying before your thought through a door that closes against your breathless wonder? Is there no ear round the ear of a man that it senses through strings and columns of air the soul of sound? I thrill as I call it a tuning fork that catches the waves of mingled music and light from afar, the antenna of thought that listens through utmost space. Surely the concord that ruled my spirit is proof of an ear that tuned me, able to tune me over and use me again if I am worthy to use. I was among multitudes of children, dancing at the foot of a mountain. A breeze blew out of the east and swept them as leaves, driving some up the slopes. All was changed. Here were flying lights and mystic moons and dream music. A cloud fell upon us. When it lifted, all was changed. I was now amid a multitude who were wrangling. Then a figure in shimmering gold and one with a trumpet and one with a stepper stood before me. They mocked me, danced the rigadoon and vanished. All was changed again. Out of a bower of poppies, a woman bared her breast and lifted her open mouth to mine. I kissed her. The taste of her lips was like salt, and she left blood on my lips. I fell, exhausted. I arose and ascended higher, but a mist as from an iceberg clouded my steps. I was cold and in pain. Then the sun streamed on me again, and I saw the mist below me hiding all below them. And I, bent over my staff, knew myself silhouetted against the snow. And above me? was a soundless air pierced by a cone of ice over which hung a solitary star. A shudder of ecstasy, a shudder of fear ran through me, but I could not return to the slopes. Nay, I wished not to return, for the spent waves of the symphony of freedom lapped at the ethereal cliffs about me. Therefore, I climbed to the pinnacle. I flung away my staff. I touched that star with my outstretched hand. I vanished utterly, for the mountain delivers to infinite truth whosoever touches the star. The earth keeps some vibration going there in your heart, and that is you. And if the people find you can fiddle, why, fiddle you must for all your life. What do you see, a harvest of clover, 
or a meadow to walk through to the river. The winds in the corn, you rub your hands for beeves hereafter ready for market. Or else, you hear the rustle of skirts like the girls when dancing at Little Groove. To Cooney Potter, a pillar of dust. Or whirling leaves meant ruinous truth. They look to me like redhead Sammy stepping it off to Tour Allure. How could I till my 40 acres, not to speak of getting more, with a medley of horns, bassoons, and piccolos stirring in my brain by crows and robins, and the creak of a windmill? Only these? And I never did start to plow in my life that someone did not stop in the road and take me away to a dance or picnic. I ended up with 40 acres. I ended up with a broken fiddle and a broken laugh and a thousand memories and not a single regret.